Every night we have the chant on developing thoughts of goodwill. Goodwill for ourselves. And it's interesting that the discussions on this topic on the canon never talk about what order you should do this in. It's only in the commentaries, the later texts. They say that you should start with yourself, then go to people who have been kind to you, people who have been good to you, your parents, other benefactors. Then move on to people you like, people you're neutral about, and finally people you don't like. That's one way of doing it, but it's good to vary it. Because ultimately you want to be able to spread thoughts of goodwill to all, without exception. The images of a conch shell trumpet that you blow and everybody all around hears it, regardless of whether you like them or not. They all get to hear the trumpet. In the same way, regardless of whether you like people or not, they should benefit from your goodwill. And to help with the heart quality that goes with that, sometimes it's good to start with people who benefited you, people for whom you're grateful, or people whom, for whom you should cultivate gratitude, people you've tended to forget about. When I was in Thailand and had whole days to myself meditating, I found myself trying to think of all the teachers I'd had from all the way from first grade on up, where they might be now. Many of them are probably dead. And to think of what I owe to them. And it was a good exercise. To reflect on the fact that where you are right now in your life is the result of a lot of people's goodness. When the Buddha taught teaching on karma, he mentioned, he said, there is mother and father. Which of course sounds obvious, but it was a controversial topic back in those times. By saying there is or there isn't mother and father, you're saying whether your parents were owed any specific debt of gratitude. When they said there isn't mother or father, they said it was just chemical elements. Human beings are just chemical elements. They happen to combine and then they give rise to your body. And that was it. There's no special virtue there. You don't owe them any real debt, either because they were just material things or because what they did was totally predetermined. They had no choice in the matter. And so when the Buddha was saying there is mother and father, he was saying you're not just the physical body. Then your parents did have freedom of choice. They could have aborted you, they could have abandoned you. The fact that you have a body, that you are a human being right now, depends on the goodness of your parents. And whether they were good parents or not good parents, you still owe them a debt of gratitude. And there are people who raised you sometimes, those weren't your parents. You think of all the special kindnesses they did for you, the, things, the ways in which they went out of their way. This is what makes human life valuable. It gives nobility to human life. The fact that other people have gone out of their way. And it should inspire us, too, to go out of our way. It feels really good when you find yourself in a position where you can give when you don't have to. That's something to be honored. And it's okay to feel good about yourself in that way. Not in the sense of trying to compare yourself as being better than other people, but you feel good in and of yourself, that you've done something good for humanity, other human beings when you didn't have to. 
It's a sign that you're not a slave to material things or a slave to your convenience. This is why the Buddha also mentioned generosity when he was discussing karma. There is a virtue to being generous. Because again, you're not forced by fatalistic forces to do that. You have the choice. And the Buddha wants you to appreciate the fact that you do have that choice. And to reflect on how good it feels when you're generous in ways where you don't have to be. So these two go together. Gratitude teaches us that we're here because of the generosity of others, and that should inspire us to be generous in turn. And thinking about these things gives energy to your practice. You're not just here for stress reduction. You're here to develop good qualities of mind. You're looking for a happiness that's harmless. That in and of itself is a gift. Could you think of all the different ways you've gone through life looking for happiness in which you've actually harmed other people? We don't like to think about it. And people tend to get very defensive when you bring it to their attention that their happiness depends on other people's suffering. And they'll do everything they can to justify it, say, oh, those people don't matter, or they're not really suffering, or whatever. Well, that's just got, to, just got to be the way it is, they say. Well, it doesn't. You have the choice to look for happiness in a way that's totally harmless. That too is worthy of respect. When you meditate, it is a noble activity. Look at the Buddha image here. Think of the different images you've seen going into different places, different places of worship. And what they say. This says you can find true happiness by looking within. Here is an example. And you can do it by developing qualities that are totally harmless. This is one of the ways in which you repay your debt to all those you've had to depend on in the past, whether you can remember the debt or not, all the people who've benefited you in one way or another, whether you've met them or not. It's one of the reasons why at the end of the meditation you always want to dedicate the merit of the meditation. To remind yourself, this isn't just about you. It's your gift to everybody. And it's in this atmosphere of generosity and gratitude that the practice flourishes. <laughs>